Dead America, Tales from the Front Lines, Safe Zone, by Derek Slayton, Chapter 1, Day Zero Plus Five. The sun hung high in the sky, casting its warm, golden light over Victory Hills Community College, a suburb nestled just to the west of Kansas City. The once peaceful neighborhood had become a battleground caught in the throes of a war that had raged for the past day. As the military forces pushed forward towards downtown, the college had been hastily transformed into a refuge for civilians caught in the crossfire. The belief was that the sprawling compound, consisting of three interconnected buildings, would provide a safe haven for non-combatants. However, as the battle unfolded, it became clear that things were not going according to plan. The relentless army of the undead pushed back, forcing the front line to retreat. Amid this chaos, the orders had come down overnight for the soldiers to abandon their position. Yet, Corporal Wilcox found himself standing resolute in the dean's office, located in the heart of the central building, gazing out at the unfolding disaster below, at his vantage point on the third floor. He surveyed the grim situation. The grounds were swarmed with zombies, numbering easily over a hundred, scattered aimlessly as they searched for something to converge upon. Most of these creatures had once been civilians, and that didn't overly concern the corporal. What sent shivers down his spine were the zombies clad in military attire. He knew that they were likely newly turned, and the thought of one of those agile runners infiltrating the building sent a chill through him. As he contemplated the dire circumstances, Private Lamb entered the room, lightly knocking on the door before stepping inside. Wilcox, I have Captain Smith on the line for you. Lamb announced, Well, I might as well get it over with. Hand me the phone. Corporal Wilcox replied, his voice resolute. Taking the phone from Lamb, Wilcox cleared his throat and spoke firmly. This is Corporal Wilcox. Captain Smith wasted no time with pleasantries and launched into a tirade, demanding to know why Wilcox had defied the order to retreat. I have a building filled with civilians, and this site is not secure, Wilcox explained, unwavering. I'm not leaving them to the monsters at the gate. You're playing with fire, Corporal. General Rothman ordered your retreat because he has another offensive staging nearby. He needs your team over there immediately. No, I will not abandon these people. Wilcox responded firmly. Wilcox could hear the blood vessels popping in the captain's head as he mumbled for a moment. Corporal, if you do not report to your assigned location in the next hour, there will be consequences, Captain Smith threatened. I'm sure there will be consequences, Wilcox retorted, his voice unwavering but I lost three men overnight defending this position, including my sergeant, and I'm not going to let them die in vain. We brought people to this place telling them it was safe and I intend on making it so. The captain's tone softened as he acknowledged the losses suffered by Wilcox's team. He spoke in hushed tones, as if sharing a secret. I'm sorry for the loss of your men, Corporal, Captain Smith said sincerely, but we're all losing our squad mates in this offensive. I'm starting to think this attack on Kansas City wasn't planned out very well, Wilcox remarked, frustration evident in his voice. There was a long pause on the line before Captain Smith continued. I wish I could say that your experience is an anomaly, Corporal, but I'm hearing more stories like this with every passing hour. I'm sorry for my tone earlier. As you can imagine, things are a little tense around here. I understand, Captain, Wilcox replied. But I can assure you that whatever you're facing back at command pales in comparison to what we're dealing with. I'm standing in a building with 150 civilians, most of whom are women and children. I'm also looking out a window at a sea of those creatures who want nothing more than to get in here. So you'll forgive me if I'm not overly concerned with what will happen to me if I happen to live long enough to make it back to base. The line fell silent before Captain Smith spoke again. Corporal, I can't authorize you and your men to stay there. However, I will put in the report that retreat is impossible, but I'm going to need your word on something. Wilcox inquired, what is it, Captain? When the line does catch up to your position, that you join the others and leave the civilians to the appropriate teams, Captain Smith requested. That way your actions back up my report, and neither of us end up on General Rothman's bad side. You have my word, Captain, Wilcox assured him. Okay, Corporal. Good luck, Captain Smith said with a hint of genuine concern. Appreciate that, Captain. Good luck to you as well. Wilcox responded before ending the call and tossing the phone back to Private Lamb. How did it go? 
Well, they're not sending a kill squad after us, so better than expected, Wilcox replied with a wry smile. Lamb nodded and remarked, small victories. With the immediate crisis addressed, Wilcox turned his attention to the situation on the ground. What's the situation down there? He asked. Lamb reported, the center complex is locked up tight. Melton, Ware, and that civilian volunteer Dennis are locking down the east wing of the complex. How bad was it down there? Wilcox inquired. Not as bad as we thought, Lamb replied. In that last breach, a couple of them must have wandered out the emergency exits because it was wide open. Wilcox shook his head in disbelief. How the hell was that not locked down? Lamb shrugged. No clue, Corporal. But it's locked down tight now. What about the West Wing? Wilcox asked. Lamb's expression turned grim. That one is still a shit show. We have the hallway barricaded as best we can, but the doors are wide open to the building. Wilcox sighed, a sense of impending dread washing over him. Any idea how many are in there? I don't know, Lamb admitted. But I do know it's more than we want to deal with. Wilcox grimaced. No kidding. Outside, as Wilcox and Lamb watched from the window, the sudden screech of tires caught their attention. They both rushed to the glass, their eyes widening at the chaotic scene unfolding before them. A sedan careened through the swarm of zombies, plowing into several of them before losing control. The vehicle skidded on the driveway, crashing violently into a tree. The impact was brutal, caving in the front of the car and shattering the front windshield. Miraculously, the side windows remained intact. Private Lamb voiced the question on both of their minds. His voice laced with concern. What the hell are we going to do, Wilcox? They watched in dread as zombies, including half a dozen runners clad in military gear, sprinted toward the crashed car. It was a dire situation. Wilcox grabbed the radio urgently. Private Melton, do you copy? Melton, who had been dealing with a zombie on the ground, responded, give me a second, Wilcox. Melton swiftly dispatched the zombie with a makeshift spear while Private Ware, using a wooden chair as a makeshift shield, fended off a trio of approaching zombies. With the immediate threats distracted, a tall, bald-headed man named Dennis sprang into action. He charged at the ghouls, using his formidable size to knock them to the ground. Dennis then delivered a powerful boot to the head of one of the fallen zombies, while Private Ware swiftly dispatched the other two with a knife to the head. Private Ware asked, are we clear? Dennis replied, I finished off the other three by the tables. Milton confirmed, I'm good here. So we're clear? Private Ware nodded. Yeah, I think we are. Melton picked up the radio. Sorry, Wilcox, we're clear down here. What's going on? A car just wrecked outside. Get up here, Wilcox ordered. Copy that. Melton dropped his hand from the radio and motioned to the others. Come on, Corporal needs us in the office. Private Ware inquired, what's going on? Some dumbass just wrecked their car. Melton explained dryly. Guess he wants us to go help. Dennis cracked his knuckles, a hint of excitement in his voice. Good. I've been looking forward to some fresh air and sunshine. As the trio of soldiers made their way out of the large eastern building, they carefully stepped over the corpses that littered the ground. Dozens of them, all of them, put down by the three warriors. Most were once civilians, but some had been wearing military attire. Dennis glanced at the two soldiers, seeing the pain etched on their faces. I'm sorry about your friends there. Dennis offered sympathetically. Private Melton responded, Appreciate it, big fella. They continued walking, exiting the building and securing both sets of double doors with chains for added security. As they moved down the long hallway toward the center building, they noticed five civilians huddled behind overturned tables in the middle of the walkway. Each of them clutched makeshift weapons, like baseball bats, and filed down broom handles. The civilians, middle-aged and out of shape, wore terrified expressions. Private Ware assured them, Don't worry, guys, you can stand down. We're clear over here. Private Melton added, But they could probably use your help on the west hallway. The civilians nodded and hurried off toward the other barricade as the soldiers continued their journey. All three men were fatigued, but their spirits lifted slightly as they entered the main area of the center building. Dozens of civilians were scattered about, some sleeping, others reading borrowed books from the school library but most simply seemed shell-shocked. The front doors were heavily barricaded, with every piece of furniture in the building pressed against them and the windows. 
Despite the security, the civilians remained hushed, not daring to make a sound that might attract the zombies outside. The trio ascended the stairs to the third floor, joining Wilcox and Lamb in the office. Both men were still fixated on the wreckage outside. Private Milton inquired, Corporal, what's the situation? Wilcox gestured for them to come closer, his expression grave. Come have a look for yourself. The trio joined them by the window and observed the scene below. The car was swarmed with a few dozen zombies surrounding it. Private Ware assessed the situation. They're not going to last much longer in there. Wilcox nodded, determination in his eyes. Which is why we have to go now if we're going to save them. Private Melton voiced his concerns. You're out of your mind, Wilcox. I may be, Wilcox admitted. But if we're here to save civilians, then that's exactly what we're going to do. What's our weapon situation? Private Melton reported, we have about 30 rounds of rifle ammo between us. Somewhere around the same amount with the sidearms. Private Ware added, I have five rounds left for the sniper rifle. Wilcox quickly made a plan. Ware, get your rifle and take out anybody down there in a military uniform. Handling a mob is bad enough without worrying about runners. Private Ware nodded and hurried off to retrieve his weapon. Wilcox continued, the rest of you, on me. I have a plan to get them out. Chapter 2 Private Ware, perched in the dean's office, carefully opened the window and took aim with his sniper rifle, peering through the scope towards the menacing mob surrounding the car. His finger hovered over the trigger, ready to respond to the impending signal. Okay, Wilcox, I'm in position and ready to roll. Just give me the signal. Private Ware whispered into his radio, the tension palpable in his voice. Corporal Wilcox's voice crackled over the radio, cool and collected. Pick off the soldiers. Copy that. Stand by. Private Ware acknowledged. He took a deep breath, his gaze locked on the throngs of undead below. Among them, he spotted his first target, a smaller soldier zombie at the outer edge of the pack. Ware squeezed the trigger, the gunshot echoing through the air, tearing into the ghoul's head and bringing it down. The surrounding zombies stirred but they didn't stray far. He continued this deadly dance, eliminating several more threats, chambering his last round. His trained eyes identified two zombies dressed in military gear. He spoke into the radio once more, a note of caution in his voice. Wilcox, I'm about to fire my final shot, but be aware. There's going to be at least one potential runner in that group. Understood, Corporal Wilcox replied. With unwavering precision, the private fired his final shot, ending the life of another undead soldier. He removed the scope from his rifle, setting the weapon aside. Good luck, boys. Give him hell. Private Ware murmured to himself. Moments later, Corporal Wilcox cautiously opened the exterior door of the East Wing. He led the way, followed by Lamb, Melton, and Dennis, all of them vigilant for any signs of zombie activity. Inside, a civilian gently closed the door behind them, giving Corporal Wilcox a nod silently pledging to assist them when they returned. The four men moved cautiously toward the front of the building, the soldiers gripping their rifles tightly. Dennis, though unarmed, wore thick leather gloves to provide some measure of protection. As they reached the corner and peered out towards the car, approximately 60 yards away, they saw the vehicle swarmed by zombies. Fortunately, it appeared the undead had not breached it. Speaking in hushed tones to avoid alerting nearby zombies, Corporal Wilcox gave his orders. Lamb, Dennis, get in position. As soon as we pull those things away from the car, you get those people out and back here. We won't be far behind. Lamb and Dennis nodded, moving up alongside the front of the building, taking cover in the bushes. They stopped just short of the front doors, ready to act when the time came. That's a hell of a run, Private Lamb whispered. We'll be fine. I'll take care of the door when we get there, Dennis replied, his gloved hand steady. Meanwhile, Wilcox and Melton broke from cover, positioning themselves behind benches and picnic tables about 40 yards away from the front of the building. The zombies by the car were now distracted, shuffling towards the new threat. Okay, Melton, we fire once each to pull them our way. The only one of those things we're worried about is the runner. Then once that thing is in range, we open up. Whatever it takes, Corporal Wilcox instructed. Private Melton nodded, his eyes locked on the approaching mob. Wilcox and Melton took aim, pulled their triggers, and sent bullets striking their targets. Zombies began to turn and move towards them, closing in. 
As the zombies advanced to, within about 15 yards of the car, both soldiers aimed their weapons, waiting for the runner to reveal itself. But it remained elusive. I thought he didn't have enough ammo for all the runners. Private Melton questioned. Corporal Wilcox grabbed his radio, frustration evident in his voice. Where the hell is that runner? A brief pause. And then Ware's voice responded. It's still by the car. Damn it. Two more shots each. We have to pull that thing away, Wilcox ordered. Melton acknowledged the command, and both men squeezed the trigger again. This time, their shots were more accurate, taking down a couple of creatures. However, half a dozen zombies, including the runner, still clung to the car. Wilcox and Melton could now clearly see the car and the frenzied runner, desperately attempting to breach the vehicle's windows, where a terrified driver remained. Hope Lamb and Dennis can handle them. Because that thing isn't taking the bait, Wilcox muttered as he shouldered his rifle and reached for a makeshift spear. Melton followed suit, the two soldiers standing ready in the picnic area, waiting for the approaching mob of zombies. Try to keep them lined up with the benches and focus on dropping the ones that come around, Wilcox advised. And when they get too close, Melton inquired. We pull them all the way through the picnic area, then make a run for the door and hope that's enough time for them to get to the car. Wilcox answered, stealing himself for the impending onslaught. Across the yard, by the front door, Lamb and Dennis watched the majority of the horde shuffle away towards their comrades. Lamb readied his rifle, but Dennis placed a firm hand on it, pushing the weapon down. What are you doing? That's a runner, Lamb whispered urgently. Dennis met Lamb's gaze with a determined stare. And I can deal with it as long as you stay quiet. Lamb was bewildered, but trusting Dennis's judgment, nodded in agreement. Okay, Dennis, I trust you. How do you want to play it? Lamb inquired, ready to follow Dennis's lead. Dennis bent down, picking up a couple of rocks from the ground, and gave Lamb a wink before making his way toward the zombies. Lamb sighed and readied his makeshift spear, following the giant of a man. They closed the gap, getting within 15 yards of the zombies, who were completely focused on the car, paying them no attention. Dennis playfully prepared his arm as if he were about to pitch a baseball before hurling a rock at the soldier zombie's back. The impact caused the creature to turn, emitting a moan before Dennis struck it in the face with another rock. The agitated zombie broke away from the car and sprinted towards Dennis, who took a few steps forward, readying himself for the confrontation. With lightning-fast reflexes, Dennis grabbed the creature's shirt and dropped to one knee, using its momentum to drop it face first into the ground snapping its neck. Dennis stood up, looking at the convulsing zombie on the ground, while Lamb stepped forward and delivered a final blow to its head with his makeshift spear. That was a hell of a move, Lamb remarked. Dennis grinned. I have some skill. I'm not just a pretty face, you know. Lamb shook his head, and they both refocused on the remaining zombies. Only a couple had broken away from the car and were now slowly shambling towards them. Dennis approached the first one, gripping its shirt and throwing it backward to the ground. Lamb calmly walked up and impaled the creature in the head with his spear. Dennis then dealt with the next zombie, using his boot to kick it in the chest, making it stumble backward into the car before it continued its approach. Lamb caught up, finishing the job by stabbing it in the head. Take a couple of steps back. I'll get them to you. Dennis instructed. Lamb complied, stepping away. One by one, Dennis yanked the distracted zombies away from the car with such force that they fell to the ground. It became an efficient assembly line, with Dennis tossing and Lamb finishing them off. It only took them a few moments before the car was finally free of zombies. Approaching the car, they looked inside and saw a dazed man behind the wheel, his head bloodied from the crash. His wife sat in the passenger seat, and there were two young children in the back, their eyes red from tears. I'll get you out of there. Just hang tight, Dennis assured them. The man nodded, and Dennis worked on the deformed door, battered from the wreck. He struggled for a moment before finally managing to pop it open, the metallic noise cutting through the air. It was enough to alert some of the zombies that had moved away. Come on, we don't have much time, Dennis urged as the family scrambled to exit through the back door. Dennis and Lamb stood guard, aware that the closest zombie was 15 yards away and closing in. Finally, the family made it out and began running towards the building, putting some distance between them and the pursuing ghouls. As they ran, Dennis let out a loud whistle, catching the attention of all the zombies and the other soldiers. 
Corporal Wilcox impaled a zombie in the eye socket with his blood-soaked spear, shoving it into the path of another approaching ghoul. He heard the whistle and quickly glanced towards the building, spotting them running towards safety. Let's move, Melton, Wilcox shouted, and both soldiers retreated several yards before turning towards the building. They ran as fast as they could, narrowly beating the pursuing zombies to the door. They managed to get inside safely, with the civilians slamming the door shut behind them. Everyone in the room worked together to reinforce the doors, despite the fact that they opened outward, not wanting to take any chances. Once the doors were secured, they took a moment to catch their breath. However, their respite was short-lived as another civilian rushed into the room, frantic and shouting, There's a breach! There's a breach! West Hallway! The panicked civilian exclaimed. The soldiers and Dennis exchanged concerned glances. Corporal Wilcox turned to the civilian next to him and issued a command. I want you to get everybody into the library and lock it down. The civilian nodded, and the four men took off running towards the west hallway. Wilcox pulled out his radio, urgently calling for Private Ware's assistance. Get your ass to the west hallway. We have a breach. Chapter 3 Four men sprinted urgently across the central building their faces etched with fear as they raced towards the west wing. Their frantic movements sent shockwaves through the room, inciting panic among the civilians who had taken refuge there. In the wake of the soldiers' dash, a few civilians instinctively fled toward the library, wisely steering clear of the soldiers in their path. Reaching the doors, the four warriors flung them open, entering the dimly lit hallway beyond. It took them a moment to take in the scene that greeted them. In the middle of the room, a makeshift barricade lay broken, tables and chairs shoved aside. Approximately two dozen zombies pressed against it, their lifeless eyes fixed on the living. In the center, a gruesome pile of creatures feasted on an unfortunate civilian. On either side, a handful of civilians strained to hold the barricade, trying to protect themselves from the advancing horde. Amidst the chaos, the screams of civilians filled the air as they struggled to withstand the weight of the relentless creatures which thrashed about, desperate to reach their prey. Concentrate the fire, so we can get our people out, shouted Corporal Wilcox urgently. The three soldiers raised their weapons, carefully selecting their targets and squeezing the triggers. A dozen rounds were sent downrange, focused on the outer edges of the mob. As the zombies began to drop, the pressure on the civilians holding the tables lessened. Start moving back towards us, ordered Corporal Wilcox. The civilians on both sides obeyed, backing up and turning to face the soldiers. With a few more well-placed shots, they cleared a path for the civilians to retreat. The tables were dropped to the ground, creating a rudimentary barrier. Terrified civilians stood there in shock, their eyes locked on the approaching zombies. One of them stammered, I'm so sorry, they just came out of the doors. We tried to hold them off, but there were just too many of them. It's okay, we'll take it from here. Go to the library with the others and lock it up tight, reassured Corporal Wilcox. The civilians nodded and hurried away. As they departed, they passed Private Ware, who entered the room. He walked up to the group, eyes fixed on the approaching mob. Christ, what did I miss? inquired Private Ware, his voice laced with concern. The doors to the West Building finally gave way, replied Corporal Wilcox grimly. Melton and Lamb unsheathed their melee weapons and took their positions at the line of tables, ready to defend against the encroaching horrors. There were only a few creatures on this side, as most were engrossed in feasting on a fallen civilian. However, beyond them, dozens of zombies poured out of the West Wing building. If we don't close and secure those exterior doors, then it's not going to matter what we do here. It's just a never-ending game of whack-a-mole, Private Ware pointed out. I'm open to ideas. Corporal Wilcox replied, casting a worried glance at the approaching mob. Because we don't have the firepower to push our way through this line. I can handle it, offered Dennis confidently. Even if you get up a full head of steam, you aren't breaking through them, warned Private Ware. Dennis smirked. Just because I'm built doesn't mean I'm a moron, Ware. I'm not going through them. I'm going to go around them. Ware looked sheepish, acknowledging his assumption was wrong. Where are you getting out at? Those things are most likely still all over the east exit. I'll hop out of a window in the library, Dennis explained. They're all boarded up, the private interjected. Dennis grinned, not on the second floor. 
With the plan set, Ware and Wilcox turned their attention to the pressing issue at hand. Melton's shout for help from the line drew their focus. They saw that the creatures had finished their grisly feast and were now advancing towards them. We need help on the line, yelled Private Melton. Ware, give the man your radio. Dennis, do what you need to do, ordered Wilcox. He then turned his gaze back to the approaching zombie horde. Just do it quick. Dennis took the radio and dashed off towards the library. Meanwhile, Wilcox and Ware picked up their spears and joined Melton and Lamb on the front line. All four swung their weapons with all their might, taking down the zombies closest to them. We have to get up to the rest of the barricade, said Corporal Wilcox urgently. How in the hell are we going to do that? Questioned Private Lamb. Wilcox pondered for a moment, his eyes landing on the tables. He shook his head, realizing it was a risky idea. Two men to a table. Pick it up and push like hell. Wilcox and Lamb grabbed the table on the left, while Melton and Ware took the other. They hoisted the tables, holding them at chest level, and pushed forward with all their strength. They had about 15 yards to cover before reaching the remnants of the barricade, which still stood, albeit mostly outside the large hole in the center. As they pushed, more and more zombies pressed against them, their flailing arms striking the soldiers in the face. Forced to backpedal by the soldiers' relentless determination, one zombie tripped and fell to the ground. Wilcox kept a vigilant eye on it as they continued pushing, knowing they'd encounter it soon. The soldiers strained under the weight of the growing zombie mob pressing against the tables, but they persevered, pushing the creatures back. They were now within five yards of the barricade remnants. Continuing to push, Wilcox spotted the fallen zombie, which had managed to flip over onto its stomach as it struggled to get up. He used one arm to draw his handgun from its holster and fired a quick shot into the back of the creature's head. Their ammunition was almost depleted, but this was a necessary use of it. The four soldiers pushed a couple more yards before they could go no further. There's too many of them, exclaimed Private Lamb. What do we do now, Wilcox? asked Private Ware, uncertainty in his voice. Corporal Wilcox's mind raced as he searched for a viable plan. The tables they were using as a barricade wouldn't hold up much longer. He glanced back, realizing they had around 40 yards of hallway to work with. We're going to have to fight them out in the open. He declared his voice firm and determined. Private Melton couldn't hide his disbelief. Are you out of your mind? If you have a better idea, then by all means. Melton, spit it out. Wilcox retorted because we can't hold these tables up much longer, so we need to thin the herd. Damn it, Melton muttered, acknowledging the grim reality. That's what I thought, Wilcox replied resolutely. On my signal, we drop the tables and retreat. He paused for a moment, making sure that everyone had heard his order. Move now. In a coordinated motion, all four soldiers dropped the tables and retreated ten yards before coming to a halt and turning around. Their melee weapons were at the ready, as they stared down the approaching horde of zombies. The creatures were clustered together, with limited space to maneuver. Currently, they were still pouring in through the center of the makeshift barricade, providing a slight reprieve. Hit them hard and shove them back. With any luck, we can create a corpse barrier, Wilcox instructed. Private Lamb couldn't help but comment. I really miss the days when a corpse barrier wasn't something in our vocabulary. The soldiers raised their weapons, standing nearly shoulder to shoulder, awaiting Wilcox's command. Let's go, he ordered. All four men surged forward, swinging and stabbing their makeshift weapons at the front line of creatures. In a swift motion, four zombies crumpled to the ground. The soldiers took a step back, hoping that the fallen bodies would impede the progress of their fellow undead. Unfortunately, none of them tripped. The men moved forward once more, delivering another series of vicious blows. Again, Four creatures collapsed, only to be swiftly enveloped by the relentless horde. This isn't working. We're losing too much ground. Private Melton exclaimed, desperation creeping into his voice. An idea sparked in Wilcox's mind. Lamb, follow my lead. Wilcox advanced with his spear, plunging it deep into the midsection of a zombie. The creature was now within touching distance but couldn't grab hold. Wilcox began swinging the impaled zombie violently from side to side, causing it to collide with others on the line, sending them tumbling to the ground. Inspired by Wilcox's success, Private Lamb replicated the maneuver, thrusting his spear into a zombie and swinging it from side to side, knocking down several more. 
with an opening created Melton, and Ware dashed forward and delivered strikes to the backs of the zombies' heads before they could rise. Despite their efforts, they could only hold the tide for a few moments. The horde continued to swell behind them, still pouring through what remained of the makeshift barricade. Wilcox attempted to swing the zombie once more, but his broomstick snapped in half. The creature lunged forward, the broken end of the stick impaling Wilcox in the side. He managed to raise his arm, preventing the zombie from biting him, but the wooden shard caused excruciating pain. Wilcox shouted Private Ware. Ware drew his handgun and fired, the bullet striking the zombie in the forehead and causing it to fall backward, dislodging the wooden shard from Wilcox's side. Gasping in pain, Wilcox crumpled to the ground. Nearby zombies lunged at him, hunger in their dead eyes. We have to pull back, Private Ware yelled urgently. Get to the doors, Melton added. Melton and Ware rushed to help Wilcox, while Lamb retrieved his spear and joined them in their retreat. They reached a set of double doors leading to the central building and hurried through, slamming them shut. However, the doors opened toward the central building, making it a challenge to hold them closed. The three soldiers pressed their backs against the doors, with Wilcox collapsing on the ground in agony. Several civilians witnessed the situation and rushed over to help, while larger individuals positioned themselves at the doors to lend their weight. A woman near the library door went inside to search for a medical kit. Meanwhile, a civilian applied pressure to Wilcox's wound, desperately trying to stem the bleeding. You're going to be okay. Just stay with me, the civilian reassured Wilcox, who nodded weakly. The other three soldiers were pressed against the doors with the civilians. Melton's gaze shifted toward the library, and he shouted, If you're strong enough to lift your body weight, get your asses out here. We need you. A dozen men and women emerged from the library, rushing over to help at the doors. They took the soldiers' positions, adding their strength to the struggle. What in the hell do we do now? Private Lamb asked, his voice filled with uncertainty. We have to hope that Dennis does what he said he could do, replied Private Melton, his tone grim. And if he can't? Private Ware inquired. Then we better start making more spears, because we're going to have a hell of a fight on our hands, Melton declared. Chapter 4 Amidst the chaos that consumed the hallway, Dennis strode through the library with unwavering determination. He moved past the trembling civilians, his footsteps echoing against the tiled floor until he located the staircase that led to the second floor. With a brisk turn, he ascended the steps, his heart pounding with purpose. Upon reaching the second floor, Dennis hastened his pace, his gaze fixing on the back windows. He pointed to a pair of middle-aged men, their families huddled beside them, seeking refuge from the unfolding nightmare. You two, follow me, he declared, his voice carrying an unmistakable authority. The two men exchanged uncertain glances, unsure of the stranger's identity and intentions. Nevertheless, they rose from their seats and followed Dennis to the windows. Positioned at the window, Dennis surveyed the unkempt expanse of grass below, which students rarely frequented. It lacked seating or parking, offering nothing but an open field. Yet, it was far from empty. Numerous zombies lurked their twisted forms pressed against the building's walls. Dennis furrowed his brow as he gauged the distance from the window to the ground, a formidable eight feet. He grimaced, realizing that the zombies below were spread out, eliminating any safe landing zone. He turned to the two men, his voice firm and determined. I want you both to spread out ten yards in opposite directions, he instructed. And when I give the signal, open the windows and create as much noise as you can. One of the civilians voiced a concern, but won't that attract them to us? Dennis offered a reassuring smile. That's precisely the idea. We're on the second floor. You'll be safe. Do it. Now. The two men obeyed, stretching open their windows and preparing for action. Dennis, however, inspected his window and realized it was insufficiently large for him to squeeze through. He emitted a grunt of frustration and surveyed his surroundings, spotting a sturdy wooden chair nearby. Make that noise, boys, he urged. The two men began shouting and pounding on the glass, drawing the attention of the nearby zombies. The creatures gradually turned toward the commotion above. Finally, one of the men gave Dennis a thumbs-up signal. With remarkable strength, Dennis lifted the heavy wooden chair and hurled it through the window, causing a spectacular crash as glass shattered. Without hesitation, he approached the window, clearing away the shards at its base. 
Looking down, he observed that the zombies remained fixated on the two men. Dennis leaped over the window's edge, gripping onto the sill to lower himself closer to the ground before releasing his hold. As soon as his feet touched the earth, he sprinted toward the West Wing building, paying no heed to the nearby zombies. He swiftly distanced himself from the pursuing undead. Reaching the building's edge, he scanned the entrance doors. Half a dozen zombies lumbered inside, with another dozen scattered across the grass, oblivious to their surroundings. Dennis scrutinized the door more closely and noted a dead zombie obstructing it, preventing it from fully closing. He cracked his knuckles, preparing for a confrontation. Staring at the problem isn't going to fix it, he mused aloud. Best get to it then. Dennis emerged from cover, clicking his tongue softly to attract the attention of a few zombies near the door, careful not to alert the others. As they shuffled toward him, he braced himself for action. The first zombie reached him, a smaller one. With a swift motion, Dennis seized the creature by its shirt and belt, flipping it over and slamming its head into the ground. The next one drew near, extending its grasping arms. Dennis clamped onto its wrist and exerted a powerful pull, sending the creature hurtling through the air into the wall. It collided with a sickening thud before collapsing. Dennis plowed through the next couple of zombies, using his shoulder to clear a path to the final obstacle barring his way to the door. He seized the last one by the throat, pushing it backward as a makeshift shield, for he couldn't discern what lay beyond the door. When he determined the immediate vicinity was clear, he hurled the zombie back into the room. Dennis shifted his focus to the zombie corpse on the ground, wrenching it aside to prevent the door from shutting behind him. Sneaking inside, he slammed the door shut. Now within the building, Dennis surveyed his surroundings for threats, and they were not difficult to find. A few dozen zombies roamed the open area, most converging near the double doors leading to the hallway. Let's play, fellas, Dennis quipped. He swiftly examined the doors, ensuring they were securely closed, which they were. They opened outward toward the yard, eliminating any risk of intrusion. Dennis's eyes darted around the room, searching for a weapon. He spotted a metal stool adjacent to a table and seized it, swinging it forcefully at a couple of approaching zombies. The impact was so brutal that the first zombie's head collided with the second obliterating it. The first zombie met its end, while the second struggled to rise, requiring a boot to the head. Three zombies advanced from his right and Dennis spun around, hurling the stool with all his might at head level. One zombie succumbed to the blow, and the others were knocked to the ground. Turning his attention to two zombies circling a wooden table, Dennis deftly maneuvered around them. He grasped their hair from behind and slammed their faces into the table's corner. The force of impact fractured their noses, rendering them immobile with a second blow. Dennis's gaze landed on the six remaining creatures in the room with him, as the others had migrated to the hallway. He flipped over a wooden chair, breaking off one of its legs and brandishing it like a makeshift weapon. Okay, who's next? He challenged, ready to confront whatever the relentless onslaught of zombies had in store. Dennis moved through the room with a calculated, almost casual stride, confronting the approaching zombies one by one. Each swing of his makeshift bludgeon ended their existence swiftly. In a matter of minutes, he had dispatched them all. Approaching the double doors leading to the main building, Dennis expected to find the soldiers at the barricade outside. However, to his surprise, the soldiers were absent and the double doors remained closed. Dennis reached for the double doors on his side, closing them securely while leaving one slightly ajar to keep an eye on the zombies outside. Retrieving his radio, he called out, Hey Wilcox, do you copy? After a moment of silence, the radio crackled to life and Private Melton's voice came through, Hey Dennis, it's Melton. What's the situation? Doors are secured and the West Building's first floor is clear, Dennis reported. But what the hell is going on out there? And where's Wilcox? Melton responded, we got overrun and had to fall back. Wilcox is injured, but he'll be fine. Relieved, Dennis asked. So he wasn't bitten? No, Melton replied. Took a wooden shard to the gut. He's going to hate life for a while, but he'll live. Dennis nodded and inquired, good. So what's the plan for dealing with this hallway? Melton explained, we're going to play peekaboo with them. You come out, smack a few in the back of the head, and get their attention. Fall back to your doors while we do the same. I like it, Dennis replied. But you'll need to give me some time to barricade the door here. 
I'm strong, but that's too big of a group for me to hold off on my own. Copy that. Just radio when you're ready, Melton instructed. Dennis placed the radio down, scanning the room for something heavy. He spotted a large wooden bookcase filled with books, and after some effort, he managed to drag it over to the doors, creating a makeshift barricade. With his broken chair leg in hand, he stepped out into the hallway. I'm on the move, Melton, Dennis radioed. Be ready to strike. We'll be ready, Melton acknowledged. Dennis approached the rear of the zombie horde, which was still struggling to get through the center of the barricade. One by one, he delivered lethal strikes with his weapon. The first few zombies fell without realizing what had hit them, as the noise from their demise drew the attention of others. Dennis let out a piercing whistle, attracting the rest of the zombies in the hallway. He alternated between striking and retreating, picking off any stragglers who ventured too far from the pack. Finally, he reached his door, shutting it with all his might. Okay, Melton, I'm at my door. Happy hunting, Dennis reported. Melton, along with Lamb and Ware, emerged from their side of the hallway, armed and ready. They watched as the mob of zombies, oblivious to their presence, shuffled away. Okay, gentlemen, let's get this cleaned up, Melton instructed. The three soldiers stepped forward, delivering precise kill shots. When they drew too much attention, they retreated strategically. It took nearly an hour, but they managed to eliminate all the zombies inside the building, covered in blood and breathing heavily. The four of them stood at the broken barricade. Dennis commented, I do believe we've had ourselves a full day. Private Lamb agreed. Ain't that the truth? Private Ware raised a question. So what do we do now? Dennis considered their next steps, stating, we need to secure those exterior doors better. They're closed up tight, but I don't want to take any chances. Private Melton added, we should also do a full sweep of the building. Those things aren't very nimble, so I doubt they got up the stairs. But I don't want any surprises. Lamb nodded and picked up his spear. I'll do that right now. Ware, you want to handle the doors? Right behind you, Lamb. As Lamb and Ware departed to attend to their respective tasks, Melton and Dennis turned and started walking back toward the central building. Dennis inquired, how's Wilcox? Melton shared, he's okay. We found a doctor of sorts who's picking out the wooden splinters. Dennis chuckled, a doctor of sorts. Melton grinned, well, he was a veterinarian. Both men burst into laughter. Dennis teased, does Wilcox know? Melton smirked, figured I'd save that fun little surprise for when he's feeling better. Their laughter echoed through the now-cleared hallway as they headed toward the central building, ready for a well-deserved break. The End